Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, September 15, 1992, Ted Weiss won the Democratic Party for his U.S. House seat. Weiss was first elected to the seat representing the west side of Manhattan in 1977. It was a very blue district. This was his seventh election in a row, so no surprise that he won the primary. Except for one thing that might be surprising, Ted Weiss died the day before the election. He had been ailing in health throughout his final term, but he stayed on the ballot, of course, and the day before primary day, which would have also been his 65th birthday, he died of a heart failure. So come primary day, he won in a landslide. He would go on to be replaced on the ballot by a man named Jerry Nadler, a man who still holds that seat. So here to discuss the curious case of Ted Weiss is, as always, Nicole Hammer of Columbia. Hello, Nikki. Hey, Jody. Um, so I'll say we're interested in the story for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that, you know, we did that Star Trek, Barack Obama, Jerry Ryan sliding doors episode. <laughs> um, and we got a number of emails afterwards pointing out other sort of political moments like this, including one of them from a listener named Alec mentioning this this Weiss story. So it's, you know, it's an interesting one of, in terms of butterfly effects. Um, it also, I think, will let us have a little bit of a conversation about incumbency and how um, you know, Weiss served until the moment he died. Nadler steps in and Nadler's still there. And this is a seat that is like very, very stable. And a lot of congressional seats are very, very stable and heavily favor the incumbent. So that might be changing. So this is kind of a chance to talk a little bit about that. But why don't we start with Ted Weiss himself? Um, the New York Times obit for him, uh, which was published on primary day that he was where he was running and won, it refers to him as a liberal stalwart. So I'm wondering if you can kind of characterize what we know about him and, and what he represents about the Democratic Party throughout the throughout the 80s. Sure. So the 1980s are a time when what it means to be a Democrat is starting to change. We've talked here before about Atari Democrats and sort of third way Democrats of Bill Clinton's era. But in 1977, when Weiss takes office, he's still that sort of old school liberal stalwart. And that meant things like supporting unions and supporting civil rights and supporting um, government programs and things like wanting to impeach Ronald Reagan for the invasion of Granada. Like right. he was a through and through Democrat and a through and through liberal, which isn't surprising since he represented the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Right. But it does feel like the story of the 80s is so dominated by Reaganism that you kind of forget that there was a political opposition. Um, what do you what do you know about this district? I mean, you know, this is one that goes from. Well, it's it's been it's been rewritten, we should say, a couple of times since Weiss, um, as districts tend to be. Um, but it went all the way from, I think, you know, Battery Park City all the way up through the west side of Manhattan into the Bronx. Um no surprise that it's deep, deep blue, right? Right. I mean, Manhattan itself is deep, deep, deep blue. But if you look at Manhattan west side versus east side, east side is where all the Republicans hang out. West side is a little bit more liberal, a little more democratic. And so this is definitely like a, a place where I think at the time of the 1992 election, a Republican hadn't won this district for a century. So this really was a true blue place in the city. So whoever won the primary was right. going to win the election. 
and we'll get to we'll get to those quirks in a second. Um, this was a seat that I guess it was previously held by Bella Abzug, who has an interesting story of her own that we that we noticed in researching this. Yeah, absolutely. So Bella Abzug had won a race um, in I think 1970 to become a, a member of Congress, and then she got redistricted, and so she had to go up against this. Um, long-term congressman, a guy named William Fitzryan, and she loses to him. And then Ryan dies between the primary and the election, and the Democratic Party puts her in his place, and so she wins the seat again until she resigns in order to go run for the Senate. Um, But I thought that that was a pretty interesting mirror there. The official congressional district of dying on the eve of your primary election. Um, I don't want to make too morose of a joke about Jerry Nadler being on the on the watch, but you know, just something to consider for Jerry Nadler. Just keep an eye Uh, out. He's been there for a while, and I do want to get to to Nadler because he certainly has, I think, picked up the mantle in terms of being a a liberal stalwart. Um, But let's go back to this moment. So we have a longtime congressman. Um, as I mentioned, it was known that he was that he was in fa- failing health, but he stayed on the ballot. And then, of course, he dies the night before the election. Um, what happens in these situations? I think we should help people understand that it's not like there is a consistent rule at every level, no matter the party, no matter what kind of race, that when someone dies, this is how they are replaced on the ballot. It really is a kind of patchwork, depending on where you are and what race, right? It's a patchwork and it's murky, right? So when this happens, so, so the first thing that goes through Democrats' minds is, OK, the election is today and people need to know that they still have to yeah. go out and vote for this guy who just died because there was another kind of fringe candidate on the ballot. And they didn't want people to default to that candidate. And so the first step was, okay, make sure that the preferred Democrat wins this election and then we'll sort things out. And sorting things out meant going back through all the dusty old statutes and trying to figure out, well, what exactly does happen when somebody dies after they've won the primary or before they've won the primary? But a deceased person is all you have left. Um, And it becomes kind of a free for all. So actually, before we get into that, though, I do. I have been trying to imagine what election day was like. I mean, you know, this is 1992. This isn't like, you know, the 1830s when right. news takes weeks to travel, as we've discussed. But I do wonder if there were some people who just didn't know that he had passed. I mean, it's it's in the Times. It's in the New York Times on election day that Tuesday. But you know, maybe some people just woke up, didn't read the paper that day, didn't listen, just went to vote on their way to work, and um, you know, and voted for the Democrat because that's what they do every time. And you know, he won overwhelmingly. So I wonder if there was an element of that. Versus what you're saying, which is now, I think, in, a, in the way that media spreads so quickly, there would definitely be that mobilization and that instant awareness effort of like, no, still vote for this guy. We have to sort of secure this seat and then we'll figure out what comes next. Yeah, I think it was a mix of both. So there certainly would have been people who just like rolled out of bed, went to the polling station, you know, had no idea that the person they were casting their ballot for had died. But the combination of television and radio and newspapers meant that a lot of people were kind of confused about what they were supposed to do. Yeah. And so there was a full court press by the Democratic Party to make sure people understood they could still vote for Weiss. Um, Because, you know, if you turn on the television first thing in the morning and you hear the person you're supposed to vote for has died, it's understandable that you would be a little confused about how things were supposed to go down. So about nine days later, there's that, as the New York Times describes it, this sort of raucous meeting of basically all the Democratic elders in New York City. You know, it sort of set off this week of petitioning and and scrambling to figure out and a bunch of people, no surprise, try and jump in and try and fill the vacuum. How then does the sort of Democratic Party decide to to figure this mess out? Yeah, it's kind of awesome how the New York Times describes it, because they're like, people were offering their condolences while also kind of saying, and I think that I would be a great person to carry on this guy's legacy. And they do sort of make a quick play for this seat. And this is where that old kind of shoe leather politics comes into play, because you have some big names. Even Bella Abzug is like, this is my old seat. I wouldn't mind being back in the Congress. Um, But Jerry Nadler had the thing that it took to win, which is he knew all of the people, the precinct captains, the, the heads of the Democratic Party throughout the city. And so he had those personal relationships with people who don't seem very important until you're running in local politics. And he was able to leverage those relationships into getting the nomination when that seat opened up. 
Yeah, if I'm reading this right, it's that local district leaders ended up choosing the committee that would then end up choosing who would be um, filling this seat. And if you know, if you know New York City politics, district leaders very important to be friendly with them. Uh, and I think Nadler had played that game, as you said, over over a, a good amount of time. Um, so. Let's do one hit on Nadler and then talk a little bit about incumbency. But, you know, Nadler then goes on to be th- be on the ballot in the general. No surprise, he wins. Um, I think a lot of people now who know Jerry Nadler's name probably know him from the last few years of, like, feuding a little bit with Donald Trump. Um, they've had their spats in New York City. And I suppose now we're living in an era where New York City's politics are all of our politics. <laughs> and so you've had this, like, Trump versus Nadler stuff spill out into um, into the national scene. But did he pick up where Weiss left off? He really did. And we should say he was feuding with Trump back before it was cool to feud with Trump. He he was was. um, denying Trump the ability to build these huge skyscrapers in his district because he thought that the land should go to the community. Um, And so he'd already been butting heads with Donald Trump many decades before the rest of us. But... You know, he was really liberal. And I mean, in the, in the, the, the biggest parallels to Weiss, um, not only did he pick up a bunch of liberal policies, but he was a big defender of Bill Clinton when it came to the impeachment hearing. So just as Weiss was trying to get Reagan impeached, um, Nadler is coming in when there's a Democratic president and protecting him from impeachment because he was on the all-important Judiciary Committee where he still is today. Um, so yes, I think that in part because of the district that he represents, in part because of the politics that he is, um, he follows fairly neatly in Ted Weiss's footsteps. Right. And so he gained this seat in 92. He still has it. As I said, Weiss had it for about 15 years before that. Um, When you read political science, there's a lot of political science around the question of incumbents. And for a long, long time, one of the best predictors of whether you would win a congressional seat was whether you held that congressional seat. Um, and I know, you know, my former colleagues at 538 have crunched some of the numbers. And for, you know, as recently as a generation or two ago of politicians, being an incumbent translated effectively to an eight point advantage in an election. Um, so that's changed a little bit. And we can talk a little bit, a little bit about how that's changed. But I mean, I think it's worth just kind of reminding people how significant it is to just hold the seat. And so even if you're someone like Jerry Nadler, who kind of finds their way into that seat, once you cross that threshold, you have a huge advantage going forward. Yeah, even just things like name recognition and having fundraising and an organization up and running, all of those things that come from incumbency actually really help politicians. And the time when incumbents are most under threat is during periods of redistricting. I mean, that's how Abzug loses her seat. Yeah. Um, Newt Gingrich, back in the early 1990s, very nearly loses his seat in a primary, in large part because redistricting put two competitive Republicans together in the same primary. And so absent that kind of threat or absent some huge scandal that really puts somebody in the crosshairs, it's really difficult for incumbents to be unseated by a newcomer until, I think, recent years where the kind of end runs you can do around the party apparatus, right? You don't necessarily need the support of the Republican Party in order to win election. You have all of these other ways of getting your message out to the base that doesn't necessarily require expensive television ads or the same kind of resources. So I think that that has undermined the power of incumbency a bit. Right. And you mentioned fundraising. And I mean, that you're, what you're sort of hinting at that, but I feel like that is the critical element here. I mean, certainly name recognition is important, but you know, you, you especially in Congress, like it's, it's always struck me as just insane that it's every two years and you hear Congress people discuss how, you know, they basically get like eight months to actually govern and then they have to start fundraising for the next election. And when you are an incumbent and when you're part of the party apparatus, there's just all sorts of built-in advantages like you were just describing on the fundraising front. Um, And so I think that's been huge. And then the end run, the media end run and medias and fundraising are often sort of closely linked. I think you're exactly right. Um, And so, you know, those numbers now, I'm looking at a 538 piece that was written in the wake of the 2018 midterms. And it really showed that a lot of the the incumbency advantage is now down closer to around three points, um, you know, from eight points, which is huge. And so we are seeing a lot more a lot more turnover. And I suppose we've seen a lot of those actually in New York, Uh, you know, a few of the more high profile places where longtime representatives have lost their seat have been in in New York. 
Yeah, I mean, you saw a lot of it on uh, in Republican circles starting in 2010. And right. more recently, you've seen liberal and left challengers defeating incumbents. Um, I think that it's, you know, part partly a, an era of... What do you call it? Um, T- tumult? Yeah. Well, b- partly it's an era of the insurgent, right? Um, which has a right. real power. Yeah. But also, I mean, legal changes. Citizens United allows a very wealthy donor to come in and wipe away any fundraising advantage that an incumbent might have. And that can can unstack the deck in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's start to wrap up here. And I do want to um, give a shout out to this email we got from Alec, which mentioned this Weiss story, but also talked about a few other butterfly moments, all in New York City politics. So, I, so it makes me wonder whether New York City politics are particularly full of these or whether you could scratch the surface of any state's politics and find stuff. But he mentioned the Weiss death. Um, Kirsten Gillibrand had an opponent, John Sweeney, who had domestic violence charges come down right before the election. And you can make a case that that really helped. Kirsten Gillibrand's Uh, election to the House. And then, of course, she went on to be a senator. Um, Alec wonderfully reminded me of the 2013 election for mayor in New York, where Anthony Weiner was in a position to do pretty well and then had his, I think I lost track, I think it's his second sexting scandal. And that kind of paved the path for Bill de Blasio. And then most recently, Letitia James, who is the AG of New York and very high profile, kind of came in after Eric Schneiderman had a Me Too moment um, and stepped aside. So, uh, yeah, maybe it's just maybe it's New York or maybe it's just kind of this stuff happens here and now here and then in uh, in politics. New York has certainly had more than its fair share of scandals, most of them by Anthony Weiner, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He does, his name does come up. Uh, yeah. I've, and this is a game. This is a game I want to play at some point, which is, you know, who's. I feel like New York, Illinois, uh, Louisiana all claim that they have the craziest political scandals and sort of rocky roads. Um, I feel like you have to throw in New Jersey and Florida. That's but true. Yeah, that's, New Jersey. Yeah, we'll, we'll, that's true. we'll get into it. Okay, so that's okay. Listeners, you can email us which state has had the rockiest political history: New York, Illinois, New Jersey, Florida, or Louisiana. That's our five right there. Okay. Let us know. You can email thisdaypod at gmail.com. <laughs> All right. Nicole Hammer, thank you as always. Thanks, Jody. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Our researcher is Jacob Feldman. He is a producer for the show along with Brittany Brown. Follow us on social media at This Day Pod. Leave a rating or review wherever you get your podcast. They really do help others discover the show. So leave a rating if you can on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the show. Thanks again to everyone who's been reaching out with comments and suggestions. You can email us again. That address is thisdaypod at gmail.com. There is also a contact form at thisdaypod.com. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening and we'll see you soon. Radio Tokyo. From Pete.